we have an outstanding guest who is going to share her story of faith and perseverance with you today. I know it's one you're going to find fascinating and truly empowering. If you've ever stepped foot in a mall in virtually any state in the United States or airport or 21 other countries around the world, you've certainly seen one of Ann Byler's franchise locations. In fact, you've probably enjoyed one of her toasty, delicious pretzels. I know she's gotten me through many business trips across the country, so I truly appreciate the work she's done there. But you may have even wondered, who is Auntie Ann? Well, today, we're going to answer that question when we talk to Ann Byler about Auntie Ann's pretzels, overcoming adversity and achieving extraordinary success. Businesswoman extraordinaire and author of two books, Twist of Faith and The Secret Lies Within, Ann Byler. Welcome to Next Steps Forward. All right. Thank you, Chris. It's an honor for me to be on your show today. Well, we really appreciate your time. So, you know, there's a lot to unpack with your business success and the way things had to unfold to make that happen. But you said something to me last week about your philosophy that I just haven't been able to get off my mind. And I think it's a great place to start a conversation today. You said a lot of people are just surviving. They need to take it up a notch from surviving to overcoming. You also added, I'm not saying that I've arrived, but it's better to overcome than live in survival mode. Why do you think most people today are surviving rather than overcoming? Well, that's a great question. And one that makes me think uh, long and hard. I've thought about this and um, I, I feel like most of us um, are okay with surviving uh, because whatever happened to us, whatever the trauma was, uh, whatever brought you into this world of uh, emotional pain or physical pain, whatever it was, you know, you're just, you experience that. And, and your thought is, if I can just get through this, if I can just, if I can just get through this a difficult time in my life. So we find ourselves after months, maybe, maybe years for me, it was many years. Uh, you know, we're, we're happy that we're just, we're just like breathing deeply and we're saying, wow, I survived. And you know what, Chris, I stayed there for a long time feeling like that was really all there was. Like there was no more to achieve or to, um, to accomplish. But when I began to share my story, which I've done now for the last 10, 12 years, I realized that there's more than surviving. And what I, what I, when I think about surviving, I, I have a picture in my mind that is somebody like myself. I'm out in the middle of the ocean and I, I'm barely keeping my head above water. I mean, the waves are crashing. There's a lot of, there's a lot of tor turmoil out there, but hey, I'm surviving. And I woke up, I didn't wake up one day, literally, but, but slowly I woke up and I realized there is more to life than surviving. It takes too much energy to survive. But really, I feel like most of us stay there because we actually um, get comfortable in our survival mode. What I know about my own experience, Chris, is that overcoming, taking it to the next level is really, it's really a process of self-will and determination. It's saying, I am not satisfied with just surviving. Okay, if I'm not satisfied, that means that self-will, my own determination, and the thought of overcoming all the obstacles that I'm going to have to overcome uh, from surviving to, to actually living an overcoming life, there is a process there. And it's, it's written in my book, All the Secret Lies Within. Uh, but I love the overcoming life because there, the struggle is, is there's still a struggle but but it doesn't wear you out because you're actually overcoming and you're making progress into a whole new life that you cannot enjoy if you're in survival mode. We're getting to your, your story there a little bit later on, um, but I just yes. thought this is a great part, a great point to raise, just given the world of COVID-19 right now, how people are surviving and, and not overcoming. And it's day-to-day -day blocking and tackling or you know coping with loss of job or loss of work hours and now dealing with uh, childcare with, with kids going back to school. And so I think you just have such a great story to help folks like that during a time like this that, you know, I appreciate you sharing that. Well, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not critical of people who are surviving because actually survivors are an amazing group of people. And, and I understand that, but, but in that mode, I just want to encourage everyone to just kick it up a notch 
And it really has to do with how we think. If you think you can, you probably will. But if you think you can't, most likely you won't. So it's an, an attitude that we need to just um, uh, kick it up a notch and believe that there is more than just surviving. Yeah, absolutely agree. And it's not being critical. It's really being supportive. You know, right absolutely. now- we're in this Groundhog Day for the last That's six, right. nine months, and we just need each other more than ever. And, and That's the right. lack of personal connectivity, people get in a bad routine, a bad habit, in a rut, if you will. And so just hearing positive reinforcement from, from folks and leaders like yourself is, is truly amazing and encouraging. So again, thank you for that. Let's go back to the business side for a minute, if we can. You created an international brand. Why in the world would you think that you haven't arrived yet? <laughs> Well, I think it's because I was born with a very curious uh, nature and I'm, I'm always curious about life and people and things and um, because, I, and I just believe there's always more. Uh, when you think that you've arrived, you actually lose sight of the more that's possible. And so I think the curiosity inside of me has always been, uh, what's next? What's around the next bend? even though I've experienced more than I ever dreamed I would as a little Amish girl growing up in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania area, uh, I would never have dreamed of the success that we've experienced. But me, uh, Chris, I have to tell you, in, in all of the success and all that's happened in my life, I have never ever felt, truly felt like I have arrived. Uh, because again, I think the curiosity that I was born with just takes me into uh, this, this thought, what's next? And I also believe that if you really feel like you've arrived, um, you, you just, I don't know, you can get lazy and uh, lethargic and uh, uh, maybe even feel like um, you're, you've arrived in a way that you're above other people or like you're more than what you really are. But I feel like when you, when you continue to believe there's more, it's, it's like plowing the field. You just keep plowing the field because there is more. I grew up with farms, so I use that term a lot, plowing the field. It's hard work to get to the next thing that God may have planned for you. Um, so having arrived, I, I cannot relate to that, honestly, because I always feel like there's more. Well, I love the question you just posed to yourself of, of what's next and posed to others. You know, I think that that's something, a, a true mindset of a real business leader and a real spiritual leader, which we'll talk about a little later yeah. as well. You know, what's next? What's out there? What else can we do? And so it's not settling, it's empowering and bettering. So Absolutely. I, just, I love that theory. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you talked about your childhood in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Let's go back to that. Uh, you know, I think people would be surprised to know that you grew up in an Amish Mennonite family in a community. Uh, I think that's a religion and life that, you know, very few people understand. You know, I live in the Northeast, so I've seen it, you know, my whole life. And so I'm familiar with it. But you know, people in the, the flyover states, they call them, or certainly the West Coast, it's just a different mm -hmm. lifestyle. Yeah. What was, your, what was your childhood like? Well, you know, we certainly were a minority group and still are, uh, even though the Amish culture um, is growing today because they, have, they do have large families and very few people uh, actually leave the old order Amish uh, traditions. Uh, my mom and dad were old order Amish, which means they they drove a horse and buggy. They had no electricity. Um, uh, most of them in back in the day were farmers. And so mom and dad, um, at the age when I was three, they left the old order Amish church. And then we went to uh, what we called the black car Amish or Amish Mennonite, which means that we could have a car. So we were now uptown and uh, my dad could farm with tractors and we could have electricity in our home and a telephone. But uh, when it comes to, you know, radio, TV, any of the extras of life, um, uh, I know I didn't grow up with the TV. I, I, we had no radios. So uh, we were informed though, because my dad read the newspaper and we'd sit around, uh, if you can imagine this, it was in the days when all 10 of us, there were five boys and three girls and mom and dad, uh, we would sit around the breakfast, lunch, and dinner table every single day without exception. It wasn't like, oh, I don't feel like going to the table to eat tonight, or I want to watch my favorite TV program, or there was no distractions. It was part of our life every single day for every year that I, uh, until I was 19, I got married at a very young age, which is uh, very normal for that, for that um, uh, the uh, culture. 
Uh, so we'd sit around the table and we would talk about what we did today. And my dad would often talk about what he read in the paper. And uh, we knew a little bit about the world events. But um, so I, growing up in that lifestyle, people often ask me, don't you feel, wasn't that boring? Or don't you feel like you missed a lot? I'm like, no, no. I, I grew up in a very safe environment and um, somewhat idyllic, I guess, but what my parents taught me was really important lessons that took me into a world of, of business and success because of what they taught me as a kid. And that was just a lot of hard work. Um, it was a faith in God. It was about family. It was about community. It was about my mom always... Uh, you know, taught us uh, little children a phrase that she used every, probably almost every day of our lives. Little children love each other. Do not give each other pain. When one speaks to you in anger, do not answer them again. So mom taught us at a very young age to get along with others. And they believed that it was important to get along with your friends and your community and the, your church world. But it was more important, uh, my mom always said, when there's love at home, uh, then that's, that's enough. And so we experienced a lot of love in our home. Was it perfect? No. Uh, my dad experienced some huge setbacks financially. And through that, we experienced as a family, his uh, depression, situational uh, depression, because he wasn't able to provide for us. And um, so there were hardships. But my parents left me with an amazing heritage. There, there was no inheritance, but there was the, the heritage that we, uh, that they left for us. Uh, I cannot uh, put it into words. It's, it's enriched my life, and it's what gave me the courage. It's what gave what I needed to go into a business that I knew nothing about. But let me tell you what I knew. I knew how to work really hard, and. Um, I had lots of faith, and that's really the two most important components that my parents left me with, and I'm forever grateful for that. Well, you mentioned no inheritance, and I think what they left you uh, is worth far more than anything Absolutely. financial or capital. Absolutely. Uh, so that's just, it's incredible. Absolutely. You, you touched briefly about marrying at an early age, the age of 19, to your teenage yes. crush, Jonas, <laughs> but it wasn't long in your marriage when your lives took a very tragic turn. Your 19-month-old daughter, Angela Joy, was killed in an accident with one of your sisters who was driving a piece of farm equipment. Understandably, that accident caused immeasurable heartache and sadness. Like many couples in that situation, you and Jonas grew apart. You saw counseling from your pastor and your life unimaginably took an even darker turn. Would you mind sharing that story with our listeners? Yes. You know, every time I, I tell my story about that, just hearing you... Um, share that snippet of my story. Um, it takes me back to a life that we lived that was, um, again, my husband and I were happily married and um, we dated three and a half years. I was 60 when I met him and <laughs> uh, what a good man he is. I, I can hardly talk about this without being emotional because um, I always believed, um, Chris, that and this was really part of my faith walk, was that if I was a good girl, then God would be very pleased with me. And if I was a bad girl, then he would probably be displeased with me. And in, in, in a short, um, what, I, what I took away from that was that life is good. God is harsh. But what I know now, uh, Chris, is that I was confused about that. And so I went into my marriage feeling like everything's good. I, I had never had any trauma in my life. My uh, husband's brother uh, was killed tragically um, a year before we got married. That was the only thing that I had experienced in my life prior to that, our, our, our own daughter uh, being killed. Um, so I really truly believe that life is good and God is harsh. And I was totally confused. So enjoying a, a good marriage, uh, Jonas was a very, he's still a very quiet man, but he's a very good man. And um, enjoying our married life, and we were in the middle of being, actually, we were youth pastors to a very large youth group back in, in the day, and 
it was a very, very exciting time. And I was not prepared for, for trauma uh, in any way. And um, the Monday morning that Angela was called, it was a beautiful fall morning. And um, we lived my mom and dad's farm and we had a little uh, double wide trailer that we had parked close to their house and we're enjoying family life so much. And Angie was uh, our, our second daughter. And um, I really uh, had mentioned to Jonas during that time, you know, life is so good. I can't imagine that it could get any better from here. It was so full and so rich. What I didn't realize back then, Chris, is that trauma changes you. And nobody's really fully prepared for trauma. At the, at the time, I was 27 years old. And um, what I know today is that there are many, many children, many people that are traumatized at a very early age that makes life very difficult for them. So I'm grateful for the years that I had to kind of, I had a strong foundation. But even with that strong foundation of faith and family, uh, when Angela was killed, uh, I was traumatized. And um, she was killed instantly as she walked up to my mom's house, which was a few hundred feet from where we lived. And my sister, who was driving a bobcat at that time, looking for my dad, loading and unloading sand. It was, there was a barn between our house and my, my parents. And my sister at that, that particular morning always looked around for the grandkids. And Angie was earlier than usual that morning. And uh, she looked around and didn't see her. And when she backed her bobcat up, um, after she was looking for Angie, she backed her bob get up. And when she did, um, and she looked forward after she was ready to move forward, then she saw Angela's uh, dead body uh, in front of the bobcat. And she had driven over her accidentally, of course. Um, <laughs> I just want people to understand trauma changes you. And unless we understand that, we can live with trauma a lifetime and really not know why we, we have uh, um, PTSD or, or why the past becomes like, like you're reliving it all over again many, many years later. Um, it changed my relationship with God, with my husband. I became withdrawn and isolated. Uh, I continued my life as before. I went to church every Sunday and if you would ask me how I was doing, I would tell you I'm just fine. Uh, because I did not have the vocabulary to talk about the deep grief that I was feeling. And so my husband and I, really during that time, um, we, there was no communication. And it was like the Great Wall of China between us. There was no way to connect uh, again. And so I lost my daughter. And in, in a way, I lost my husband. And so I withdrew and isolated myself um, and all the while pretending that I'm okay. And this went on for about five months. And then I went to see my pastor back in the day. Counseling was really kind of, um, it, it really wasn't talked a lot. Uh, it wasn't talked about, like it wasn't an option uh, for us. And so I went to see my pastor who I felt like was, I was at my wits end. And I, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't talk to anybody. And I was going deeper and deeper into despair and depression. And so I went to see him. And before I left his office that day, um, he took advantage of me um, physically. Uh, again, <laughs> uh, I knew nothing about sexual abuse. I knew nothing. I, I didn't know anything about um, any of what, what he just did to me. And so I took it upon myself to blame me. I did something wrong. Uh, why did he do that to me? And I was totally confused, but I knew in deep in my gut that it wasn't okay, but I was, um, I didn't know what to, how to talk about it. So I decided I did make a very firm decision in my heart, in my head, as I walked out of the office and I decided I would never tell anyone what he did to me because nobody would believe me. And that was, Chris, that was the very first lie that I believed that nobody would believe me. And then deciding to keep a secret, which then took me into seven years of sexual abuse uh, with my pastor. Uh, and I had no idea what was happening to me, but it took me into the, the darkest place, the darkest abyss. I, I didn't know there was a dark place like that. And I knew there was no way out. I totally believed there was no way out. And all of this happened, of course, um, before uh, Auntie Anne's. 
we focused a lot on your faith and we'll, we'll be talking about it much more. But it seems Jonas's faith was tested to the breaking point and yet it remained unbroken. Amazingly, he decided that he wanted to become a family counselor to offer free counseling services to help others who are enduring the same painful experiences. What did that say to you about him and, and your faith in God? Oh. <laughs> so initially what that said to me, what that about his, um, I want to say his um, belief in me. When I no longer believed in myself, there were three things that I totally 100% believed at the end of those seven years. I knew that I was unlovable. I knew, was, I, knew I was unforgivable. And I knew that I was unchangeable. It's kind of like the old saying, like, you know, well, this is, this is just how it is. Uh, you've made your bed, so now you got to just lay in it. Uh, it's accepting what happened to you, uh, and there's really nothing that you can do to change it. And sadly, that's where still many people live there because in our pain, we truly don't know how to come out of our pain. We really do need someone to help us. But the problem with that is we don't even want to ask for help. And so when my husband, um, there was three things that I truly believed as well during that time. And that was that I believed in three types of confession. And one was what I call my bedside prayers. I did it every day. And I want to say that I wept my way through those seven years. So it's the bedside prayers and it's the journaling. I began to write because I couldn't tell, but I began to write what I was feeling and what I was experiencing. And th those two components were two steps in the right direction. And then the third step was what I discovered much later was the one to another confession, which is a found in the Bible. And as I was praying one day and just weeping my way through another prayer and God just Audib not audibly, but spoke very clearly in my heart. And he said, Anne, get up off your knees and go tell Jonas what's going on in your life. Well, I argued and I fought it in my heart. And I said, I can't do that. I, I can't do that because I know that if he knows, then he will divorce me. He will leave me. And then I won't have family anymore. He'll take the girls with him. And but the voice just persisted and finally I got up off my knees and I drove to his body shop where he was a he was a repairman and I told him what was going on in two sentences because Chris at that time I weighed 90 pounds I didn't I hated me I didn't believe in me um I believed all the lies about me and I I was a shell and I told him I had two sentences and I just told him that I was sorry for what I did and that I was a sorry person. And the look in his face was um, one of complete, which I had never seen, complete, um, um, just pain-filled, disbelief, shock. I couldn't bear looking at him. So I turned around, we never hugged. I, I, didn't, I didn't wait for him to say anything. I turned around and I left. And later that day, when we finally were able to, to talk, he said to me, it was eight hours later, and during those eight hours, I was in agony, knowing that he was going to come home and divorce me. And we stood in our little kitchen in True, Texas. And he said to me, "Hun, I know that you, that you aren't happy, that you haven't been happy for ever since Angie was killed. And he said, you, you know, I want you to be happy. And I, he said, promise me that you won't leave me in the middle of the night and leave a note on the dresser. And I said, okay. But he said, if you want to go, just let me know and we'll find a place for you. I'll help you. But he said, if you go, you have to take the girls with you because they need their mother. Chris. He believed in me when I had nothing left to believe in. 
not even his love, not even God's love. And I had no self love. The power, the gift of someone believing in you. I cannot, I cannot tell you how important that is for those of us who are well. And I can say that today. I haven't arrived yet, but I am well. <laughs> and when I see someone in that place, my heart wants to reach out to them and believe in them and tell them that they are a person of value, that it's not all lost, that there is hope, that you are lovable, you're forgivable, and you're changeable. And that's what my husband did for me that day. Although I would never have been able to verbalize that that day but as the years uh, weeks months and years went by he gave me the greatest gift he never told me that he forgave me but in a roundabout way he told me that he believed in me and my husband saved my life i always tell i always say that jesus and jonas saved my life i needed both but jonas became Jesus in the flesh for me. And that's what I needed that day. That's a, a very difficult story uh, to share with us. And so I truly appreciate you taking the time to, to walk us through that. You know, I imagine a few people know that Auntie Anne's pretzels was a product of that excruciatingly painful time in your life. Why did you choose to try and sell pretzels? <laughs> I love the lighter side of my story, Chris. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Thank you for taking us right into this. Absolutely. <laughs> well, the truth is I did not decide to sell pretzels. Um, going through what we'd been through, Jonas began studying. Um, back in the day, it was um, what we called correspondence courses. And he uh, studied from a, a place from Akron, Ohio, called Emerge Ministry. It was a counseling center. And he became very, very intrigued with psychology. And so he became a layman's counselor. And he began to understand what happened to me and what happened to our family. And um, this same pastor also, uh, as was revealed much later, my two sisters were also um, abused by him during the very same time that I was and none of us knew anything about it. And, you know, so that subject is a, 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 for another time on your show, I suppose. But um, so my husband became very intrigued with uh, the behaviors of people. How can this be? How could this happen right under my nose for seven years? How, how can this happen to our family? And many years later, we found out they'd also abused our youngest daughter, who at the time was uh, just a little girl, three, three years old, through the time she was seven or eight years old. So the psychology and the, and, and the understanding that he began to have about counseling, just he became obsessed with that. Before he was obsessed with cars and motors and how to fix things. But now he became obsessed with human behavior, psychology, what makes people tick. And um, because of that, um, he began counseling. And he was doing it as a free service in the Amish men in a community. And um, so after about one month of that, now realize this was seven years after I made this uh, confession to my husband. So we had years of um, to, um, to, to get well and to learn to be married again and to, to love each other fully. But it was during that time he was studying. And so at one point he was doing this as a free service in our community. And I said, "Hun, um, I mean, I think I need to go to work to make some money because this is really not putting any money in the bank. And I was happy that he was doing that. I, I didn't care at all because I was so proud of him for uh, accomplishing what he did. And, um, and so I, I went to work at a farmer's market and there is where I was introduced to hand rolled soft pretzels. And I worked for seven months for a, a, a man by the name of uh, Dave Esch, who has since passed on to, uh, he's since gone to heaven, but loved this man. And he kind of um, helped me begin to believe in myself. And I worked for one day for him. And uh, on Monday, he came by my house and said, I want you to manage my stand, my pretzel stand. I'm like, oh, no, I started crying. I said, Dave, I, I can't manage this. I, I don't know anything about this. I, I mean, I'll work for you, but I don't want to manage. And once again, Dave said, Ann, I watched you work for one day. You could manage my store. Again, somebody believing in me. And uh, anyway, that took me into the world of pretzels. And seven months later, 
uh, we bought our own store, uh, which is a story all in its own. And we bought that store. Uh, initially, we did not know that they were selling pretzels as well. As well, It was a farmer's market stand 20 minutes from our house. Uh, and uh, we bought the stand sight unseen. We bought it over the phone. And uh, they told us, uh, gave us the price. It was $6,000. We had no money in the bank. We had nothing. We had, uh, had just uh, uh, lost our house to the bank. And my husband was counseling free of service, uh, free service. And I hadn't been working. So we had no money. But my uh, father-in-law said, if you want to buy that stand, uh, I'll pay, I'll give you the money and you can pay me back whenever you want. So we bought his store, sight unseen, uh, went over to my father-in-law and bought and, and uh, got the check. And uh, we drove to the people's home and gave them this check. And then we went to see what we bought. So now you understand with that little bit of information, <laughs> I knew nothing about business, but what I knew at that moment, Chris, was that we had a purpose and I'm going to work to support my husband. And I hope like crazy, we make some money, but if we don't make a lot of money, I want to support my husband. So the, the purpose part of why we went into business is why we then later became very successful. I truly believe that. In 2006, Auntie Anne's rolled its one billionth pretzel, and the business earned more than $265 million in that year alone. And how much satisfaction did you get from that? And what keeps <laughs> you from resting on your laurels at that point? <laughs> well, as I mentioned earlier, more is always uh, in the back of my mind, more, what, what's next? So, uh, but really that was beyond my wildest dream. You know, when we started one store, uh, I was happy with one store. Never planned on the second one, but we did two the first year, the next year we did 12, the following year we did 35. So, you know, I really had very little time to think about what was going on. I, I was in, in work mode 24 seven, think about, and it was what was the most part, exciting part of, I shouldn't say the most, but one of the most exciting parts of Auntie Anne's was the fact that God had created Auntie Anne's to give. We knew that. And so the bigger the company became and the more money that we made, the more we were able to give away. It was, it was like every morning, Chris, I thought, this is another day. We're going to make some more money and we're going to be able to give more money away. And it became my passion. It became, I was almost obsessed with it. So, you know, when we did 265 million in that year alone, um, that was great. And, and it was very satisfying to me, but it was not about how much money we were making. It was really about how much uh, money could we give away. And so, you know, feeling like I had arrived then was, it, it was, it never entered my mind. I just kept thinking there's more. And that's really what then took us, uh, took us to more, you know, um, going then to right now, I think uh, last year, uh, Aunt Chan's was maybe at 850 million in annual sales. And you know, when you think about that, so it's still kind of a small company, but it's just a pretzel and lemonade. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So anyway, it's beyond my wildest dreams. It truly is. That's a lot of pretzels and lemonade. And I think I shared with you <laughs> last week, you know, the, the, the treat my son gets when we come home from the mall locally is uh, getting his Auntie Anne's out the door. So <laughs> big fans and supporters. So thank you for, uh, <laughs> That Absolutely. one billion pretzel and many more. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so let's take you back to your childhood a bit. You left school after the eighth grade, but I understand you earned your GED at the age of 50. Mm -hmm. you, were, you were certainly a millionaire many times over by then. Why did it matter to you to, to do that, to finish that degree? Well, you know what I believe about leadership, Chris, is that as leaders, it's not about the perks. It's not about who we are. It's like we're really extremely successful. It's not about walking into the office and acting like you're the boss. Uh, it's really all about leadership and it's all about being an example. And it's really about responsibility. And that's what I felt as a leader at Indian. I felt like it's my responsibility to lead well, uh, to be a good example if I needed to go into the office and uh, clean the toilets, I never thought twice about that. If I needed to go to the office and uh, find out from my assistant, uh, what kind of coffee would you like and go get her coffee. It's really about serving others is what keeps you focused on other people, not on yourself. 
And so um, getting to the point and understanding my responsibility as a leader, I kept hearing uh, occasionally I would hear when I would go to stores, I would visit every store that opened and I would hear from some of the em employees because back in the day we had hired lots of uh, high school employees and uh, kids that were in college and, and they still do. But back in the day, I remember um, feeling so grateful to these kids for being the worker bees of our company. And I would hear them say to me, Auntie and I know that you just, um, I mean, my story was out there and they knew I had um, an eighth grade education growing up in the Amish culture. I I'm not a high school dropout. So I want your viewers to know that I believe in education, but in the Amish culture, uh, you really didn't, I didn't have a choice to go to high school through eighth grade. And then you work uh, on the farm or you help your parents make uh, ends meet on the farm. So that's what I did. I did it all with joy, have no regrets about that at all. But I kept hearing the, the line like, oh, you never went to high school. I mean, I'm going to high school. I don't like school, blah, blah, blah. I mean, there was this kind of thing about, oh, maybe because you didn't go to high school, then I don't need to either. I mean, look, you could be successful without it. I really felt like it was important for me to be an example. And as much, I loved school when I went to school and I was always a great, I, always, I was an A student and I, I enjoyed learning. So I decided that I'm going to go back and get my GED uh, to be an example. That's the only reason I did it. And um, what I discovered that uh, during that time, Chris, was that I loved learning. And I, I passed with flying colors and it was amazing. And I actually walked the aisle with a cap and gown and I graduated. It was so exciting at the age of 50. And uh, again, going back to as leaders, it's not about the perks. It's about our responsibility. And I feel like that keeps a company strong when we can serve our people instead of um, feeling like they owe me something. It's more about how can I help you? That, that was really my model. Oh, what, a, what a great model it is and a great role model for your employees, especially those you know, in high school and, and not sure whether they're going to finish or not. So uh, hats off to you uh, for completing that. Now let's talk about Thank your you. books. How did you decide to write Twist of Faith and what did you want to convey with that? Well, you know, um, with my history having the, the dark side to it, that, that honestly, it was always in my mind. It was always there. And back in the day, I hadn't really talked about it. My husband and I and friends and family knew my story somewhat, but, but I did not want to talk about it. I, didn't, I wanted to leave it behind me. And the, the, the bigger the company grew and the more I was asked to, to tell my story on major networks and um, <laughs> I, I became worried. I was worried that somebody would maybe blackmail me or like somebody would come up with my story and, and I would just one day wake up. I know it's unfounded probably, but there was that possibility that uh, it, it could come back to haunt me. And um, I, I kind of lived in fear of this because it was always in my mind. And one day I was invited to speak on a Christian television uh, network in 19, I think it was 1994. And uh, during that show, I was not planning on telling my deep dark secret, but they wanted to talk about Auntie Anne's and, and uh, the company. And I was very happy about that. But during the conversation, it took a very different twist. And um, she asked me about my personal story in my life. And oh my goodness, before I knew it, I was telling my story on national television. And I talked about my experience with the, the, the pastor. And at that time, I thought it was, it was an affair. <laughs> but what I understand, if you read my book, The Secret Lies Within, I understand better now. Affair is very different than being sexually abused. So I understand that now. But, but it was then that I told my secret. It was after that, then I decided I really need to write a book so that people understand and that they know my story so that other people don't tell my story. And um, you do know it's better for you to tell your story than have somebody else tell your story for you because you're the only one that really knows your story. So that event really gave me the courage then to write Twist of Faith. And I did it with fear and trembling and anxiousness. And like, I, I didn't know if I could write my story, but my daughter encouraged me one day. I said to her, my youngest daughter, I said, I, I can't write the bad stuff about me. I just said, mom, whatever grinds your belly, whatever get what, what, that nut in your stomach, whatever it is that you don't want to tell, 
that's your real story, mom. You got to tell it all. And I'm like, okay. So she helped me find the courage. And so we came out with Twist of Faith. I believe the year was 2008. And let me tell you, when I held that book in my hand, I felt like a free woman. I can't even explain it. But it was an amazing transformation that took place in my life at that moment. And from that point on, uh, I was no longer afraid to tell my story. And I can tell the story today without feeling any pain, any blame, any shame, because I can truly say I'm free indeed. I want to encourage your listeners to, first of all, understand that you do have a story to tell. And number two, tell your story. Um, if, it's, if it's just over a cup of coffee to someone safe, begin to tell your story. And I have told my story so much and what surprises me most about this, Chris, is that every time I tell my story, I come back and I tell my husband, "Hun, I don't understand this, but I feel a little bit more free after telling my story one more time. I don't get that, but it's the truth. Yeah, I totally agree with that and understand that. And you make a point here of telling your story, even just to somebody safe over a cup of coffee. Absolutely. You know, and we can all world, do that. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think... And correct me if I'm wrong, but people are just afraid of the, the stigma. You know, what will somebody think of me if, you know, it's so, I'm frail yes. and broken, but it's not the right word, yes. but there's something buried yes. in there. Absolutely. And it needs to come out so that you can be free. Yes. No, and so truly inspirational and hopefully others will follow your, your suit there. Thank your second you. book, Secret Lies Within, is a very different book. Uh, it's more personal and it might be a bit uncomfortable for some readers. What mm -hmm. led you into, into writing the second book? Well, after I experienced such freedom uh, in those years from, I would say, 2010 through 2019 is when the book was released. I really felt like there was another book, uh, two more books inside of me. And uh, I was, um, I wanted the, the Secret Lies uh, Within to be more about, uh, my, my first book was truly my story, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It is what it is, and it's, it's, uh, um, it, it's, it's uh, timeless. Uh, the Secret Lies Within, I was felt a little bit more purposeful with that book in that, that I want people, I want the reader, men or women, to understand what abuse is, what it looks like, uh, what you can actually do to, to, uh, to help your, your children, to educate your kids about abuse. And it's a book about how I was able to overcome trauma and to find purpose in my pain. You know, for years, I pushed it down. I, I just kept pushing it down. I didn't understand that my pain, out of my pain, my purpose was actually being formed. Now, many of your listeners aren't there yet, and they may, that may sound foreign to them. But let me tell you, if it wasn't for the pain in my life, I would not be on your show today because I would still be silent, uh, hoping that it'll just go away one day and someday I'm going to be okay. No, you get okay. You become better as you open up your life and you begin to be real, open, honest, transparent, share your story, and eventually um, you, you're gonna feel the freedom of that. So the secret lies within is very purposeful in the fact that I want people to understand uh, there's more to your life than trying to stuff your past. Writing a book is a big undertaking and, and knowing how much pain you went through writing those first couple of books, do you think you have another one anytime soon in you? I have one more <laughs> and that one's, it's a business book, which um, I'm probably equally excited about that one because when I go speak, um, Chris, many times I feel like I, 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 I tell my story, but I don't have anything to give to the audience. And I'm so excited that I'll be able to do this uh, possibly next year. I can't tell you when next year, but it's, it's done. It's, it's, uh, we've just completed the editing part of it. Um, so it's going to be the, the title is not for sure, but uh, what we're thinking around now, overcoming to lead. Um, so you'll hear more about that in, in the coming months, but I'm very excited about that. And the book is really about how I uh, was able to lead our company from one little farmer's market stand um, to around the world. And when I say I, um, it's not about me. It's about the great people that were around me. So and let me tell you quickly as well, I didn't do it perfectly, but I did it with such passion and purpose. And the people around me just became purposeful as well with the brand. And the people around me were the people that built Auntie Anne's, which I'm forever grateful for. I'm still, I think about them and I still feel emotional about 
the people that came to work every day and gave me their very best, their talents, their gifts. I mean, no complaining. It was amazing to me. Uh, I love Auntie Anne's and I still call Auntie Anne's. I call them my people, even though I don't own the company anymore. <laughs> they are my people. Uh, that's terrific. Well, let's talk about something really fun. At least I, th I think it's fun since <laughs> we're doing part of it here. You also have your own podcast, Living a Life mm -hmm. Unleashed, which I recommend to our listeners. One of your episodes is titled Finding Purpose in Your Pain and the Power of Confession. Mm -hmm. That's based on the scripture, James 5.16, isn't it? Yes, it is. Would you share your perspective on that, please? It sounds like a very simple con concept. It's a very small little verse somewhere toward the end of the Bible in James. And it says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. And there's the promise you'll be healed. It's what it says. And I knew that verse as a kid, as a teenager, as a mother, as a wife, as a businesswoman, but I honestly had no idea uh, that the, the power of that verse. And so, as I mentioned to you earlier, when I finally was able to confess to my husband, that was the verse, that was the impetus for me to be able to, to, to understand and what I call the one to another confession. That's what it is. Confess your faults, your sins, your struggles, your frustrations, life, your story, whatever it is that really bothers you, that's what we need to learn how to, to tell each other. And when I began to open my life up to this one to another confession, at first it was scary as heck. I'm telling you, I, I mean, to tell my husband my secret and then to even after that, Many times my palms would sweat. My heart, my heart is racing. My head is spinning. I can't do this. I cannot be honest about my faults, my failures, my sins, things that I have done wrong to hurt you. I can't do this. But what I've learned, Chris, is that I can do this. And I have learned, I went from the impossibility of the uh, being open, honest, transparent, and vulnerable and make this hard. I call it a new view of confession because we see confession as being subjective. I got to tell you if I did something really bad, like I stole some money or I killed somebody or I had a divorce or I, I committed adultery or I'm a liar. But you know what I discovered is that it's the little things in my family life that are hard for me to admit that I, I hurt you. And this has helped me so much um, to the one to another confession to where now I've done it so long that if I hurt somebody, something happens in my stomach and I begin to churn. And I know it's time for me to be humble enough to go and say, hey, I'm sorry, I hurt your feelings. And that's the way I live my life today. If it wasn't for that little verse in James 5, 16, I would never have known how to do that. But it's been, and I call it the one to another lifestyle of confession. It's a wonderful day, way to live. Well, I highly encourage our listeners to, to search for your, your podcast. Where can they find you? I just go to antianbyler.com and you'll find everything there is to know about me and more. Perfect. And I highly <laughs> recommend uh, the listeners to pick up your books. They're available on Amazon as well as on our yes. show's homepage. So Absolutely. Uh, they're great reads. You know, we've got just a few minutes left here and you know, there's a lot more to talk about. Uh, you know, you're launching your ministry, Broken Silence. You know, as we wrap up today's program, you know, when you look back on all of your accomplishments, which one or ones do you treasure the most? Oh my, I've often said that, you know, most people know about Hinty Ann's and, and they would think that that's my greatest success. I mean, it, it truly is a great success story, but Auntie Ann's, the business is not my greatest success. My greatest success is overcoming Ann Byler, Auntie Ann the person. Um, because truly, if if I wasn't able to overcome myself, I would never have been able to, I may have been able to build a company, Chris, but I would never have been able to enjoy the journey and the fruits of our labor today. Um, overcoming myself meant that I could stay with my husband. Like we're married 52 years. We have four beautiful grandkids. We have two beautiful daughters. All of that was almost gone for me. And if I would not have dug deeper and overcame myself, I would not be experiencing that today. Thank you, Ann Byler, for sharing your incredible, incredible journey. And thank you for tuning in to Next Steps Forward. I'm Chris Meek. We'll see you back here next week. Until then, 
Stay safe and keep taking your next steps forward. Thank you and God bless.